My name is Kumar Venkateswar. I'm a product manager in the Amazon SageMaker team. And the topic we're talking about is algorithms and frameworks. So uh, I hope most of you had an opportunity to attend an, uh, an earlier session about SageMaker just as a kind of introduction. But in case you weren't able to, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of the context in which SageMaker sits, as, and then we'll dive into what it means for SageMaker to offer algorithms and frameworks and what kinds of things that we offer and the kinds of things that you would be able to do with the built-in algorithms in SageMaker and why they're, they're uh, particularly effective at the kinds of things they do. So as a background, machine learning, the kinds of things that we do in machine learning that we attempt to do are some of the hardest problems in computer science. And we try to do things that humans are particularly effective at doing, and computers in general are not, traditionally have not been particularly good at it. Um, things like learning and, and language perception, e even now the way, uh, the, the way most of these problems are approached, computers need a lot more data than your typical three-year-old would to solve these problems. But we go ahead, we try and solve these problems, and the reason we solve these problems is because We've seen, particularly in Amazon, we've seen a lot of good effect out of attempting to solve these problems. We've, we've done things like uh, personalized recommendations is one of the first places that we started out as a company. And the recommendations that come out with uh, experience and a lot of data, the, the recommendations are really quite good. Um, we've seen excellent results in terms of fulfillment and, and optimization of, of deliveries. And as a result of the efforts that we've put into machine learning, we're able to, to offer things like two-day delivery. And we continue to push the boundaries of machine learning uh, by doing things like drones, looking, looking into drones, um, voice-driven interaction type things in, in Alexa and the Echo devices, and, and even uh, things like Amazon Go, where you have an experience of you pick things off the shelf and walk out of the store, and it automatically has figured out what you took off the shelf and bills you for it. So there's a lot of magical experiences that you can create with machine learning. And part of what we want to do at, uh, at Amazon at AWS is enable you to have those experiences. And essentially, we want you to join the thousands of customers that we have running various machine learning uh, uh, projects, very, various machine learning products on AWS. And this is everyone from uh, Pinterest and, and Netflix, some of the bigger, more experienced machine learning folks, to uh, smaller companies as well. And we see this as something that is a, a core capability that everyone should have, and our goal is to really enable that for everyone. We want to make it so that it's accessible for every developer and every data scientist. And the core here is in algorithms and frameworks. By helping with algorithms and frameworks in this uh, overall stack of machine learning services, we actually provide capabilities to developers where the applications themselves are something that's core to your business. Where if, if you want to rely on Amazon data and Amazon expertise, and there's a set of services that you can consume at the top of the stack, these application services, that we've produced that use machine learning under the covers, and you're able to incorporate them into your applications and, and provide uh, a, a, a machine learning type of experience to your customers, you're able to leverage uh, our expertise and our data for, for those. When it comes to the platform services, these are areas where you may have specific data that can apply to these problems, or uh, it's an area that is so core to your business that you want to apply your own efforts towards that. And enabling that is, is something that we're trying to do uh, as a, in, in Amazon SageMaker, and that's why we actually have this stable of algorithms and frameworks. The, the other thing to notice here is that we're not particularly convicted about which framework is the best for your business. 
And, and the reason for this is we, we see that it's your business. You have the best visibility into what will work best for your business, as a result of which we want to support everything. We want to support things like MXNet and PyTorch and TensorFlow in an equal fashion so that AWS is the best place for you to run your workloads, regardless of which framework you choose. Um, Certainly, there, there are cases where we found it particularly effective. MXNet is something that we found particularly effective, but we don't have full visibility into your business, so our choice is to support all of the frameworks. In addition to that, we also uh, don't have particular conviction about what kind of hardware will work best for your problem. So we support both GPU and CPU. And in the, in the case of, of certain problems, particularly those around image analysis and, and uh, 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 large data problems that are easily parallelizable, uh, GPU certainly works out very well. And we have a set of uh, hardware in AWS that is state of the art. Uh, hopefully, some of you had a chance to, to catch an earlier session today uh, that was focused on the hardware. But we have state-of-the-art GPU as well as uh, state-of-the-art Intel CPU hardware uh, in, in, in AWS. But the thing we're here to talk about is how we take advantage of that state-of-the-art infrastructure and how we uh, create this platform that is easy to use through these what we call 10x better algorithms. And we have a set of algorithms that in some ways are uh, very much better. I mean, 10x is, a, uh, is, is in some ways a, a placeholder, but is very much better than the most easily available uh, algorithm that's out there. P particularly open source is, the, is our standard of comparison. We wanted to put in our efforts to make it so that it was either 10x easier to use, 10x faster, 10x more scalable, um, in order to make it so that you would be able to take advantage of it to iterate faster in your machine learning process. So to kind of look at the machine learning process and look at where algorithms fit into this, um, the, the first part of it is uh, around framing the business problem and understanding what data would be used to answer that problem. So the kind of thing that you would want to do is you want to, uh, you want to get to the where it is something that you can easily collect data in order to answer the problem. If you have a, a poorly posed machine learning problem, something like, uh, how do I use machine learning to improve my business? It's really very difficult to find out what the, the data set is that would uh, enable you to answer that question effectively. On the other hand, if you got to the point where you said, uh, hey, customer churn is a really big problem with my business, how do I figure out which customers are more likely to churn in the next six months? That's a much more defined problem and something you can start collecting data for. So then you collect data for it, and you uh, uh, clean the data up in, in various ways. You normalize it. Uh, you turn it into something that is actually suitable for machine learning. Um, machine learning is, is pretty exacting about the kinds of data that go into it because computers are not easily able to identify the difference or the fact that something like US, USA, United States are all synonymous. So as a result of that, there is some effort that's involved in the, in the front to kind of... Uh, uh, make the data suitable for machine learning. Similarly, there's, there's efforts that people make around um, uh, binning things, turning uh, uh, continuous variable, variables into categorical, and, and, and so on, or uh, vectorization of, of, of words, and, and so on that you would want to do. So that sort of feeds into, once you are able to produce these features and uh, uh, create a set of data that you think would be suitable for machine learning, then you start the training process and the tuning process where uh, you select an algorithm, you figure out the suitable algorithm, and then you tune the various parameters around learning so that the result of that is something that's a good uh, machine learning model that is able to provide the predictions that you need in order to improve your business. And then if the, if the business goals aren't met, you, you say, well, hey, can I collect 
additional data in order to make it better? Is there something that I can do in order to improve it so that my business goals are met? Or is there a way that I can process the data in a way such that it's more suitable? Can I do some what they call feature engineering uh, in order to make it more useful? And then once that's done, you actually deploy that model into production, whatever production environment that might be, and you use it as part of your production process. You monitor it. You understand what the performance is. You see, is it actually meeting my performance goals in the production environment, the same goals that I had uh, when, I, when I was doing this offline process against historical data? If it worked the same way, then it's actually helping your business. And then it's an iterative process. So then you say, well, I have a new set of data, a new set of learnings. And maybe I can leverage that new set of learnings in order to do even better. So you end up with this process that, that, goes, uh, that, that goes through where you collect data, you, you deploy the machine learning model, you learn more as the result of the changed experience, and then you do it over again. And this cycle prior to SageMaker was uh, something on the order of 6 to 18 months for, for customers. Uh, our goal with SageMaker was to, to bring it down to, to weeks or ideally even days. And this is the area that we really focused on with SageMaker, where we said we want to make it very easy to, to do the visualization and analysis. We want to make it super easy to do training, especially distributed training. And because of that, we want to have a, a stable of algorithms that scales out to as much data as customers you guys want to use with it. So when we thought about that, we said, well, if customers want to get started with machine learning, and they have a, a large data set which wish uh, they want to get started, but they don't really know where to get started, the, the first thing that we need to do is we need to produce a set of these built-in algorithms that is very suitable for solving these problems in a commercial setting. And there's, there's a bit of a bias in, in uh, some of the open source projects. I won't say it's all of them. There's certainly some that are, are, are very commercially focused, especially those that are uh, associated with, with uh, companies that are supporting them. But there's something of a bias in certain open source projects where it is biased towards academic research. And as a result of that, you see uh, some, some things where the training is super easy, but then uh, uh, the, the deployment into production is left as an exercise for the reader, uh, if, if you've seen that sort of thing. Um, we wanted to make sure that we thought about this end-to-end, -end, and we thought about it from you have the data in a place that you can understand. It's a data lake, ideally in AWS, that you would be able to take. Uh, do machine learning on top of it, you take that model, and then you deploy it into a production environment. That would be wrapped by an application and or incorporated in as part of an application that would provide the experiences that you want for your end users. And we were thinking about this holistically, and we continue to think about this as, a, uh, as an end-to-end -end process that is not just limited to SageMaker, but beyond SageMaker as well. So in that context, what we said is we need to have this set of general purpose built-in algorithms that can be used for the most common machine learning problems that are out there. And we looked at, at Amazon.com, of course, um, but we also asked our customers, hey, what are you guys doing? What kind of machine learning are you really doing? What are the problems that you're solving? And what are the algorithms that you're using for those problems? And we got those responses back, and we said, OK, if we were to write those from scratch, what is the thing that we would do? Knowing everything that we know about how to run these things at scale, how to run these things highly reliably, how to run these things in large data sets. So we came up with a set of algorithms that we thought we could do really well with. And we started out with these um, general supervised uh, learning methods, uh, starting with XGBoost, uh, factorization machines, uh, linear regression and, and certain auto-regressive models. And we said, OK, we, we can handle the supervised stuff, which is essentially uh, a set of data where a human being or some other process 
resulted in the knowledge of what is true. So you're predicting something that you can verify afterwards that you know is true. Uh, flight delay, for instance, you know after the fact whether a flight is delayed or not. You may not know before, but you can predict whether a flight is, is delayed or not. And then after the fact, you can come back and you can say, yes, the prediction was right. No, the prediction wasn't right. And then use that as part of your training set. So this is the, the, the first set of algorithms that we produce. Then the second set, we said, well, in the cases where you don't have a clear understanding of what the, the true or not relationship is, there are a general set of algorithms that people use that are called unsupervised algorithms. And in general, they're used for things like uh, grouping, grouping related objects together, or they're used for um, uh, what they call dimensionality reduction. So they're trying to pull out the key uh, aspects of, of those, uh, the, those collection of objects so that you can do various other types of machine learning on top of them. So, we said, OK, let's start out with, with clustering and, and principal component analysis, two of which are very common methods for, uh, for use in, in unsupervised applications. And then we said, well, we've got those, but we also want to make sure that we have specific algorithms that are useful in certain verticals. So we said, we'll do image classification. Um, I, I would add object detection to this list, uh, since we now have object detection as well. And then those would be the image-focused ones. And then we have a set around, uh, primarily around language-focused. Uh, so if you have uh, big sets of text, like um, reviews, or call center transcripts, or anything where the documents, anything where you have this big blob of text that is really hard to, to process as is, um, we, we have a set of algorithms that are based around that. So uh, uh, topic modeling, uh, sequence to sequence is something that's useful for, for summarization. Um, blazing text is a, uh, converts words to, to vectors. So this set of algorithms we thought is, is like a, a baseline set where if you're starting out with your machine learning journey, you need a good stable of algorithms that you can rely on that are going to work really well so that you can start with these machine learning processes. The other thing that we did here was we said, uh, um, we have to design them for huge data sets. So we, we looked at, at uh, existing implementations of these algorithms. And uh, I'll, I'll present a bit of data later. But essentially, you see that some of these algorithms don't even work with fairly realistic data sets that you have today, like terabyte scale data sets. I mean, terabytes is, is a lot of data. But at the same time, when you, when you can buy a, a laptop with a terabyte hard disk, it's not really an unrealistic amount of data. And we saw that some customers in, in things like the, the IoT space and, and so on were, were collecting tens of terabytes to hundreds of terabytes of data. And we said, well, we really need to rewrite some of these things in order to make them work on large, large data sets. And we said, how do we reconceive the, the way these, these algorithms work so that they will work with these data sets? Um, traditionally, the way, the way that algorithms work is you copy the data set to each instance. So then if you have 10 training instances, you now have 10x the amount of storage that you did before. And if you were paying for a terabyte, you know, you're now paying for 11 because you went from the original terabyte that was stored, you copied it to all the instances, now you've got ten, one terabyte on each, you've got 11 times the storage cost, and it multiplies super rapidly. So we said, okay, that doesn't work. That's, that's just not what we want our customers to do. Let's try and figure out how to stream these data sets. So the first thing we did was, let's have streaming data sets and support all of these algorithms, make sure that they support these streaming data sets. The second thing we did was we said, well, if it's a really big data set, you don't want to keep going back in the data set and start training and then go back and then forward and back. And that just ends up being really slow because in general, uh, random access to, to data is much slower than sequential access. So we said, OK, we have to do single pass. Not just streaming, but it has to be single pass. 
The third thing we said was, if you want a terabyte scale, terabyte scale training, you, you can't fail in the middle. Because if you fail in the middle, you fail 3 quarters of the way through or 90% of the way through. And then you have to go back just because something crashed. That's just not the way to train a terabyte scale data set. So we said the third thing we have to do is we have to have great reliability on these large data sets. So we started out with this premise. And then we started looking at the characteristics of how these algorithms actually work. So Usually, there's this relationship between cost and time. And you say, well, if you want to uh, train quickly, oops, if you want to train quickly, then you end up paying more uh, compared to a single machine. So because there's some cost involved of distributing the data around and, and, and having multiple machines, and there's some communication cost between these, these instances. And we said, well, can we, can we actually do something better? So for starters, we said, OK, well, streaming will help. Because the way we would uh, uh, address it if we were streaming is we'd have this, this uh, relatively constant uh, memory, and we'd bring it down so that we'd see roughly linear growth in time, time and cost with respect to uh, data size. So that's not too bad. It, it's not as bad as, uh, as what we saw before. The fact that we have this streaming means we've, we've cut down on some of the communication overhead. Then the next thing we do is um, we, we, we say, OK, well, how do, we, how do we make this distributed problem simpler? And traditionally, the way you do it, you, you copy all the data to all of these, uh, the, these machines. They all have a copy of the data. They all have their individual state. And then you have some sort of reduced step uh, at the end to, to uh, consolidate all of the learning from all of these. Instead, what we, uh, what we decided was we need this shared state idea. So they'd, they'd each have a piece of the data. They'd calculate their their local state, and then they'd share the state using um, a, a parameter server type of infrastructure, or there's, there's a, a, f a couple of other models that have come out since then that uh, uh, allow these instances to share knowledge even during the training process. So when we did those two steps, what we ended up seeing was we actually ended up seeing the entire curve come down in terms of cost. So overall, SageMaker, uh, SageMaker algorithms ended up being cheaper and faster than the, the nearest equivalents. Sorry. I... So essentially what we have is we end up having this set of infinitely scalable, or what we call infinitely scalable algorithms. And that shows up in each of these, these steps where we say, OK, what does that look like for, for a linear learner? And linear learner, linear regressions, are the most commonly used machine learning uh, algorithm out there. Um, I'd, I, is something on the order of 50% of machine learning is done on, on linear slash gradient boosted trees, that, that type of, uh, of thing. So they're very, very common. Um, they're, you, they're also extremely fast, which means that they're used in a variety of applications, even if they're not necessarily the highest quality. The fact that they are very quick to, to form inferences makes them very useful. So, uh, they're used for things like spam, spam classification, uh, URL classification, uh, various things like that. And we said, OK, let's, let's try and take these data sets and see how they work in, in our algorithms. So we looked at that. And the result of that was uh, we ended up with a much cheaper cost at each stage on this, as well as much better results in terms of how accurate the models were. So if you look at these curves, it's um, something like 25% of the cost or, or even less. Very similarly, uh, another very common algorithm that's used is, is factorization machines. So 
Factorization machines are, are typically used in, in recommendation type problems. And uh, it's used uh, uh, product recommendation, uh, click, click recommend, add click recommendation, and, and so on. So we, we tried this out on a, on a terabyte size advertising data set with uh, um, fairly small machines. I, I mean, M4.4x large isn't the largest uh, class of, uh, of machines that, that AWS offers. Um, and you see that one of the characteristics of the implementation that we have is that it scales linearly, essentially linearly, where it's constant cost, no matter how many instances that you use for it. So if you say, well, I want it in 20% of the time, and I'm only going to use 5x the machines, you're actually able to, to do that. And if you think about how difficult a, a computer science problem it is to, to achieve that kind of scaling, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible work that the team actually did in order to get there. Very, very similarly, uh, we looked at, at, the, at the clustering algorithm. And this is one of those where you uh, try and find clusters uh, um, by specifying the number of clusters. And I'll actually show a demo of that slightly later, uh, how, how that looks. And if you look at the running time uh, versus the, the number of clusters, we, we had 10x faster in terms of um, the, the nearest open source uh, equivalent. So we ended up with a, a, a very, very fast implementation of, of k-means. Uh, similarly, with, with uh, principal component analysis, we, we ended up with this very fast implementation uh, of principal components. And we were 10x faster at, at a, a small fraction of, of the cost. And essentially, what you end up uh, having is you end up having a, a, a situation where you want to spend a certain amount and you want the highest accuracy that you would be able to get at it. And there's some trade-off of, uh, of, uh, of spending versus the accuracy that you would get from the, uh, the model. But essentially, at every cost point, you're able to get a better model. Uh, another case where we were able to achieve excellent results was in topic modeling. And we compared that as well, the neural topic modeling versus uh, equivalent, uh, equivalent models. And we saw that the number of topics uh, versus the number of topics, we were actually able to get a much, much more accurate model for, for topic modeling. And then last in this, in this series, I'll talk about uh, uh, deep AR. Uh, deep, with deep AR, we were actually able to get much, much better forecasting as well. So essentially, with this set of algorithms, you're able to achieve a much better, a, a much better result in spite of the fact that you're spending less money in order to uh, achieve these results. But we didn't stop there. We said, OK, we also want to, even in areas that we're not able to uh, uh, achieve these similar uh, results, we'll still go ahead and implement that functionality. And we'll provide the equivalent functionality to, to existing al algorithms as well. So we have uh, uh, spectral LDA, which is another algorithm. Al algorithm that we have for, for topic modeling that we were able to provide, as well as uh, uh, boosted decision trees, which again is a, is a very common algorithm that is, is used for a wide variety of problems. Um, Actually, Boost is actually particularly interesting because it's something that could be used for a wide variety of problems. And the combination of XGBoost with automatic model tuning has proven to be very, very powerful uh, for existing SageMaker customers. We've seen uh, some great results in the, in the fraud modeling space, where uh, they're able to distinguish between fraud, fraud and, and not fraud uh, transactions uh, based on, on this modeling technique. 
And then uh, I'll, I'll go through a few more, and then uh, we'll, we'll jump into a demo. Um, sequence to sequence is, a, is, is something that uh, people use for, for summarization of, of documents. And we found that uh, both, both using uh, RNNs and CNNs uh, uh, as part of the, the, the process that we were able to achieve really great results. And the advantage of, of being able to use these algorithms is that with the way these algorithms are implemented, you don't have a need to understand the underlying uh, neural networks either. Um, whereas you still have some control of them through the hyperparameters, you don't need to encode them or code them from scratch like you would normally have to do. Very similarly for image classification, um, we have an implementation of, of ResNet that is, that is capable of doing image classification. And, and similarly, for, for object detection, we have a, a single-shot single uh, algorithm that, that you can use based on ResNet that you would be able to, to classify images. And that also is sped up by the fact that you're able to do this uh, without, without coding. And then, uh, very similarly, we have blazing text, um, which is another algorithm that we were able to use in order to have a fast implementation of, of word to vector. And that has been uh, uh, very, very successful uh, as well. And then um, random cut forest is, is another algorithm that we have seen has great results in, in anomaly detection. So the, the takeaway I have here is that we have this pretty broad set of algorithms that you can use uh, using Amazon SageMaker that you would be able to quickly get up and running with machine learning, no matter what your machine learning problem is. And I'm going to quickly switch over to uh, uh, a demo to kind of show how you're able to have some flexibility to use different frameworks and different algorithms uh, and with similar semantics in, in SageMaker so that we can see how that works in practice. Let's see. So, I have an example here that um, uh, I think of as the, the hello world type example. And it's, uh, it uses a data set called MNIST, which is a, a collection of images of uh, handwritten, uh, handwritten digits. So it's a, a relatively simple set of data. And one of the algorithms that people commonly use on that is they use MNIST uh, for, for clustering. Let's, let's try and, as a first pass, let's say, uh, I don't know uh, how, to, how to really pull out the information in these digits. Let me just cluster them together so that, as a naive idea, I'm going to group together related images, and I hope each group has each digit in it. So you can kind of see, if you look at the data set, um, some of these. Some of these digits are pretty poorly written. Uh, it came off of, I think it's uh, census data or something like that. So, so they're fairly difficult to, uh, to recognize digits. And then we went ahead and, and trained a model off of it. And one of the things that, that we did, because we wanted to make these more accessible, is we said, let's, let's try and find a way that is um, uh, relatively Python, Python native and looks kind of uh, uh, similar to other Python functions so that it's very easy to use. And we did this across all of the algorithms. So I'm actually going to switch over from this k-means, and I'll show you what it looks like in, in TensorFlow and PyTorch as well. So if you look at the TensorFlow one, it looks almost identical to the way that you would do it with k-means. Instead of having a k-means object, you actually have a TensorFlow object instead. Um, you have an additional way to specify the, the TensorFlow script that you're running. But the way you specify the instance count, the way you specify the instance type, 
Um, in, in some ways, the way you pass the role, all of that is very similar. Very similarly, if you look at PyTorch, it's almost the same. You, you still have a script, you pass in a role. In this case, I'm actually passing in a, a framework version. But if you look at it, you have very similar semantics, which means that as you switch between frameworks and as you switch between algorithms, you, you still retain a lot of the familiarity between them, which means that as you go from, I have one problem to solve to, I want to use machine learning through my entire organization, the amount of mental context switching you have between them isn't as much as you would think. And this is important because the way most people end up using these things is um, something like two thirds of data scientists use more than one, uh, one framework for, for what they're doing. And you want to make sure that each, each data scientist is working very efficiently, which means that they need to have as little context switching between them as possible. The other thing is, so I'll kind of show, show the way this works. Um, the, the, way, the way we have it here is if you execute the training, you end up with enough detailed information that you can understand what happened through the training process. And this is available through the Jupyter Notebook, which is, which is a pretty common interface used for data science. But in addition to that, this also goes into CloudWatch logs, which means that you can access it in a way that's friendly to the data scientist, but also in a way that's friendly to IT operations, which means that if you want to use it with your regular log processing tools, it's in the place that you would uh, want it to be to use your log processing tools as well. And then if we go ahead and, and say, OK, we're going to deploy that behind a, uh, a REST endpoint and take a look at the predictions. So this is something that, again, it has that uniformity across all of the frameworks, which means that deploying a model that would be used for k-means is very similar to the way that you would de deploy a model that would be used for uh, PyTorch or for TensorFlow. So you end up with this very similar type of, uh, of mental model about the way that you should work. So then if we look at uh, one of the clusters, I mean, some of the clusters are better than others. This one uh, uh, looks, looks pretty good. It looks like it's all twos. And then there's some that are um, you know, somewhat, somewhat mixed. You, you've got one that's fours and nines. Um, but that's, that's part of uh, the, the iteration process. You still want to have the freedom to try things out and say, does it actually work or, or not? Can I, can I try something different? And then what you can do is you can move on to something different. So I'll flip over to the, to the PyTorch version, which actually works much better and is, is something that's able to, to identify the digits better. But if you notice, the logging is very similar. It's got a similar uh, type of experience, which means that you don't need to do a whole lot of shifting when you go from machine learning model or uh, machine learning algorithm to another one or from even from one machine learning algorithm to, to deep learning. So then if we look at this model, I've, I've uh, deployed it with very similar semantics. And then now I can uh, kind of uh, see how it does against a handwritten digit. So I'm going to draw a four out here. And then we'll see how it, how it did on the prediction. It tells me it's a six. So you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's it's not perfect, and it's certainly going to make some mistakes, but maybe we can uh, figure out how to make it better. So there you go. It, it predicts a f uh, four. So uh, essentially, you can see that you would be able to have the same type of experience and the same type of, of um, uh, way of doing things across all of the al algorithms and across all of the frameworks. So switch over. So essentially, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we wanted to enable. The, the other thing that we wanted to enable is that we wanted to make it so that you could also use these custom algorithms. If you were developing your own algorithm, 
we wanted to make it so that you could bring in your own algorithm using these same interfaces because we, we know that machine learning is a, is a pretty rapidly developing field and there is a lot of expertise uh, out there. We're clearly not the experts in every aspect of machine learning. So we wanted to enable it so that you could bring in your own algorithms and still have the same semantics. So the way this works is, is through a specific Docker interface. And we provide this specific Docker interface. You upload these, the, the Docker images to uh, uh, EC2 container registry. And then these get pulled down. And these work exactly the same way as the built-in algorithms. These work exactly the same way as the frameworks. And in fact, we've even open sourced these framework, uh, framework images so that you can take those and you can make derivatives of them for your particular use case. So essentially, what you can do is you can uh, take these. You can, you can use it on a, a single machine. You can use it locally, um, the same, same container, and have the same semantics. Because the, the Python library that we provided is open source, you can run it locally on your laptop. You can run it in a managed notebook instance like I did in SageMaker. And you can run it on, a, on the full data set in a, in a GPU cluster with up to 100 instances. And you can deploy that into production. And you're able to make it work along with you. So regardless of how you want to work, regardless of whether you want to use a sample data set for prototyping, or regardless of whether it's uh, something that's full production on a terabyte scale data set, you're able to do it with that. And very, very simple to bring your own container as well. And this is essentially the type of semantics that, that you would use for the, the, the Docker container. You can, it's a standard uh, Docker run train, Docker run image serve, that kind of thing. And we also support GPU containers. Because essentially, this is the same, um, these are the same containers that we use as well. So because it's the same type of container interface across custom algorithms, across the algorithms that we bring, and the frameworks, that means that it has the full capabilities that SageMaker has to offer, including automatic model tuning on your own custom algorithms. So this has been pretty successful. We've, we've had a lot of uh, uh, happy customers, uh, including uh, GE Healthcare, who, who I know spoke uh, very kindly about us this morning, uh, as well as, as Tinder and, and even Grammarly for, for grammar checking. Um, we, we've had customer success. We're looking forward to being able to, to, to serve all of you as well. And we continue to iterate on it. So uh, the, the ones I've highlighted are actually the algorithm-related launches that we've done recently. Uh, in, the, in the last couple of months, we've launched Chainer and PyTorch. Uh, those were, were driven by customer request. Um, we've also had enhancements to Blazing Text. We've had enhancements to Linear Learner, as well as the uh, Deep AR forecasting algorithm. Um, the other thing we, we enabled was, was uh, the, the streaming mode that I talked about. The streaming mode that I talked about is actually available not only in the built-in algorithms, it's also available in the TensorFlow algorithms, which means that you have an example uh, because we've not only implemented it in the, the, the TensorFlow image, but we've also open sourced it, which means that you have an example that you can use in order to de develop your own custom algorithms if you choose to use the streaming interface. So we, we want to make it possible for you to integrate with SageMaker in whatever way that makes sense for your business. And overall, this fits into this, this broad ecosystem of, of services. It's not just about SageMaker. There's uh, the S3 data lake, which, which is very crucial for, for data storage. And we, we have this um, broad set of services in AWS that accrue towards making this machine learning platform. So even though I, I talk a lot about SageMaker as, as the machine learning platform, it's built upon the set of services that you need in order to make your uh, machine learning work for your overall business. And with that, thank you very much. Um, 
I'm sure I have a little time for, for questions, so if there are any questions, um, please go to the mic. Otherwise, um, please submit feedback and let me know how things are. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, question about the built-in algorithms. Sure. Any plans on expanding to more, like deep learning type of algorithms as a built-in, like a general purpose neural network? Got it. Um, so so for, the, for the folks on Twitch, I'm repeating the question. Um, there was a question about whether uh, we would be offering more general purpose uh, algorithms or expanding the set of algorithms like a general purpose neural network? And the answer is uh, um, we, we absolutely are looking into it. It's something that I've heard from, from other, other customers. Uh, at the point at which we understand how to do it, we, we will re release. Uh, some of these things are, are actually difficult engineering and difficult science. So. Um, we we want to make sure that when we come out with something, it has to be as rock solid as all of the other uh, algorithms that are out there. So we're, we're, that's definitely something that that we would like to release. Um, one of it's like you had um, um, a bullet point about the automatic model tuning. Um, how does it actually do that? Because like when you were showing this code for semantics, right, you were specifying a number of epochs and things like that. Does it automatically kind of go through and, and tune your hyperparameters as it goes through their data set? That's a great question. So the question was, how does, uh, how, how does the automatic model tuning uh, work? Does it, does it actually have a specified number of epochs and so on? Um, it's, actually, it, it's actually a little more complicated than that. So the way uh, um, the automatic model tuning works is it, it actually, you're able to specify a total number of training jobs that you would like to launch and then how many uh, training jobs you would like to execute concurrently. So you can say, uh, I want a total of 100 training jobs. I want to optimize over 100 training jobs. And I want 10 to execute concurrently. And then within those training jobs, you can actually say, and I want each to have 10 training epochs. And I want each of those to have uh, uh, 10 instances to distribute among 10 instances. And you're able to do all of that. So the way it would work is it would actually train the, uh, train the first batch and then use that uh, as, as a, a, a way to understand which part of the parameter space to explore. So then the next 10, because it uses Bayesian optimization. So it actually randomly distributes the, the, the first set through the entire parameter space and then figures out over over the course of each iteration, which part of the parameter space is, is most likely to result in, a, in an optimal um, hyperparameter set. Does that make sense? Yeah, so as it goes through, it, it'll tune the learning rate, it'll, go, it'll tune the activation functions and all that stuff as in each epoch. So the question was, can, can, it, can it tune the learning rate and activation functions? Yeah, yes. So depending on which hyperparameters you, you tell it to fix, you can actually say, fix these hyperparameters and tune these hyperparameters within these ranges. And um, these, these other ones, these are categorical and, and tune these as well. So you, you actually have a great deal of control over the process. And the other thing I'd like to add is, not only can you do that, but you can do that with custom algorithms as well. Because the way that we actually understand the, the, the way that we actually measure the optimization function isn't specific to any of the things that we do. What, we, what you ex essentially have the ability to do is um, you specify a regular expression that uh, describes what that optimization output looks like in the log lines. So we'll extract that out of the log lines and then optimize on that basis, which means that essentially you, you can write your own algorithm and you can use our automatic model tuning against your own algorithm in, in a very similar fashion that you would for our built-in or even the frameworks. Make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions. So 
first one. Mm -hmm. So ca can we create an endpoint? So uh, suppose we have created a, mo a model, we had done the learning, we found that, yes, it is giving uh, our satisfactory result. And after mm -hmm. that, uh, can we uh, create any endpoint so that we can call it from other applications so that it will be visible to any GUI sort of things? I mean to say beyond AWS. Got it. So, so the question was, uh, can, you, can you take a model that you've trained and found satisfactory and put it behind an endpoint that is accessible outside of AWS as well as within AWS? And, yes. and, and the answer is yes. Um, the way that you would actually do that is that, uh, or, or one way you could do it, is you could actually use something like um, uh, AWS Lambda. As, as a front to call that, that endpoint. And then you put API gateway in front of uh, the, the Lambda. And then you use co Cognito, Amazon Cognito, in order to have an anonymous authentication to that API gateway. So that's one way you could do it. But essentially, what you would need to do is you'd need to have a layer that handles that AWS authentication because the way, the way the AWS endpoints work is they, they, they require authentication, which means that you have a separate auth layer. Uh, Cognito is one of the services that, that provides you with that auth layer. Okay. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah. So but awesome. I, I hope that uh, required documentation is available in the web, right? Uh, the, the required uh, documentation should be available. Uh, uh, barring that, there's, there's actually the machine learning blog uh, the AWS machine learning blog, and I'm, I'm fairly sure there's an example of exactly how to do that, that authentication in the, in the AWS machine learning blog. Okay, yeah, thanks for answering. Now my next question. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, how you are taking care of continuous learning? Say, uh, today I had completed uh, the learning, the model is good to, for the result. Now, data is all uh, keep changing, right? So. 10 days, 15 days, 13 days. So how, uh, how will continuously feed data to uh, our model? How you are taking care of that? Got it. That's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, uh, the, the question was, how do we take care of continuous learning where more data comes in, we, we want to train a, a model off of the new data that comes in and continuously learn from that, exactly. that data flow? Um, so there's, there's a few models of doing that. And because of the way that, that, because of the services that we provide, there's a great deal of flexibility in how exactly you can do that. So the, the way that you would want to do it is you would want to create a, a, a function in AWS Lambda to kick off the training job and to uh, deploy it in, in a, in A-B testing type fashion. Because you don't want to deploy it fully and replace the, end, the, the model behind the endpoint because there is the risk of something went wrong in the overall process, and the result of that would be that you have a bad model in your production. So usually the way that people do that is by deploying in a stepwise fact, uh, fashion. You say, OK, I'm going to deploy. It'll take 5% of the production traffic. Now that the 5% shows that it's actually doing well, then take 50, 95, 100, something, something like that, where you have this, this staged uh, uh, deployment. So you'd want to create a process uh, around that. And Lambda is, is one of the examples of, uh, of a way that you can do that. And then the second thing you would want to do once you have that retraining process uh, codified is you'd want to have a trigger that actually triggers it. So there's uh, several ways you can do, do that trigger. One is uh, having a CloudWatch event that is based on time. So you can say, I want this to trigger every week. So then I'll have a CloudWatch event that fires every week. It kicks off this Lambda. The Lambda retrains. This deploys into production, and so on. And that, that's actually a fairly uh, common pattern for doing it. The second way that you could do it is that you could actually trigger it off of an amount of data. So you could say, well, I've accumulated another megabyte of data. And this megabyte of data can now be used in order to, to trigger off training, or something like that. Or a third way that you could do it is you could say, I'm going to do it off of the number of predictions and use the number of predictions as a proxy for how much activity there is and how much uh, data I'm collecting. So then you could do it off of number of predictions. Or 
The fourth way you could trigger it is you could say, I'm actually going to directly measure the model performance in production. And once it's no longer meeting my business goals, then that's the point at which I'll retrain. So there, there is a great deal of flexibility uh, in, in how you would do it. We're, we're not particularly prescriptive about which way that you would do it. Um, but the building blocks for how to do that are all there. Because all of these services are, are API driven. Um, SageMaker in general is API driven. Even if I show you a console experience, the console is actually calling the public APIs in order to trigger these things, whether it's training or, or inference or, or so on, which means that you have a, a great deal of flexibility for how you would be able to architect a solution that would meet your, your, your learning requirement. Okay. okay. Probably a longer example than you, you, you expected, but hopefully that it was able to, to answer. Yeah, I, I got that one. So, Thank you. Yeah, and, and now my last question. So, <laughs> Absolutely. So there are n number of machine learning algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. So say one particular algorithm is uh, working good in G, but that algorithm is not working that well for me. So shall I have uh, the independence of choosing that wh which algorithm I want to use? Say I don't want to use k-means class studying or principal root of, uh, so. So, so shall I have that independence that which algorithm shall I choose and which not? Or, or it is or by default the SageMaker is determining uh, the bunch of algorithm that will run in the back end. Oh. It's always, uh, de as a developer, we will never have the independence of choosing the algorithm. No, no. so that's a great question. Do you have the independence of, of choosing the algorithm that you would use for a, a particular problem? Absolutely. Absolutely, because um, we, we, know, we know that in, in, in most cases, the, the, the knowledge about how to choose an algorithm is, is best with the person who is closest to the data. So uh, yeah, absolutely, you can choose the data. SageMaker doesn't make any uh, particular assumptions about how you should choose the algorithm. The, the, the choices of algorithms that we provide is actually to make it so that you don't have to redevelop every algorithm. So all of the algorithms that I talked about, we, we made good implementations of them, so you wouldn't have to re-implement the algorithm. But choosing the algorithm uh, itself, you can absolutely choose any algorithm. And in fact, you can choose to implement an algorithm that is not there in SageMaker through the frameworks. And by providing framework support, we actually make it uh, uh, the process of developing an algorithm easier for, for some set of developers. Or if you really want to develop it from scratch, we even provide those interfaces. So essentially, you have full freedom to develop the algorithm or to use the built-in algorithms or, or built-in frameworks in any way that you want. And the, the idea for doing it this way was so that any, anybody with the expertise was able to still take advantage of all of the, the rest of the goodness that, that SageMaker has to offer in that you can do uh, distributed training, you can do automatic model tuning, you can deploy into production, you can scale those models. I mean, all of that is still available even if you choose to implement your own algorithm and you, f you feel like you have the expertise more, the, the, the knowledge and expertise more than anyone else uh, in order to implement it, we still want to help you uh, be more efficient about the things that we feel like we're good at. And all, all the framework and everything in Python, is it? Pa pardon me? Uh, all the framework, uh, uh, the coding framework is in Python? Uh, all, of the, all of the frameworks are in Python, yes, that is, that is true. Um, we, we found that Python is, is the most asked for language. Um, the, the, the thing that we have heard other people ask for is uh, we've, we've heard them ask for R as well. And because of that, we, we have a, a template for how you can bring your own R environment into, uh, into SageMaker as well. But in, in general, uh, it's not even, uh, it, you're not even limited to Python if you're bringing your own algorithm because uh, all, all you would have to do is make sure that the interfaces are conformant with the, the, uh, the interface specifications we have. So we, we don't really care what's in the Docker image. Uh, we'll, we'll just run whatever is there in the Docker image in that particular way, and we expect certain responses. So it's, uh, at, at the point at which you're bringing your own algorithm, it's, it's very flexible. 
Okay. Thanks a lot. Th Thank you. Thanks. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. I'm happy to uh, uh, take questions afterwards, but uh, I think we're done. <laughs>